what feeling am I really looking for here? I want to numb out or I want to, or I'm bored or I'm, I don't want to do, I don't want to do this hard task I have coming up, you know? And so the real question is like, what are you hoping that scrolling will solve for you? Welcome to the Optimalist Podcast, where we've set out to examine the higher order capabilities that we need to build an optimal future with AI. I am Sarah, your host through this exploration of the elements of human flourishing. So let's figure out together how we cultivate them. Today, I welcome Sheila Carroll, a mom, a board certified pediatrician, an obesity medicine physician, and a certified life coach. Through personal experience over many years, Sheila has gained insights into her thought patterns and acquired the tools to permanently end overeating. In this episode, we talk about how she helps parents now help their children to find the same confidence and mental clarity that she found. And we analyze the intersection between what causes people to reach for unhealthy snacks and what causes people to reach for their phones or social media. All this and more in today's conversation. That point of remembering that we are human in this, in this very modern world, I talk about that a lot too with people and parents because we are this very ancient human being where, you know, we evolve very, very slowly over thousands and thousands of, you know, all the years. Mm -hmm. But right now we are living in this time, especially if we're talking about nutrition or health, we are living in this time of the vast majority of foods that are being sold, marketed to, to our kids, but to us as well. They weren't as our, our human bodies weren't designed to handle these foods. So you have to have some awareness of, of your actual humanness to decide what food choices you're going to make on a, if, if you really want to own your health and hopefully stay as healthy as possible. Yeah. That self awareness that I think you're referring to is something that we are defining as a, really, really unique way that human beings need to become. It's almost like we have to evolve with our self-awareness, right? We have to adapt to what it is that needs our attention as time goes on. And I think that we're in this crazy stretch of history right now where so much is being, not just our time is being filled up with just stuff and a lot of stuff that doesn't really do anything for us mentally or physically in any way. We then think that we have to keep filling ourselves with things. And, you know, it's one of the reasons that I was drawn to talking to you was that concept of, I, I think you mentioned dopamine hits and all that stuff in, in um, your original uh, email to me. And I have been reflecting a little bit on what that actually means for us as modern human beings. I mean, you're thinking about like the filling of the body. What does that mean? It's the same thing as filling your mind. It's the same thing. Like we have those same tendencies to just do or to fill time with things that are not meaningful or we don't need or don't nourish us in some way. And so before we jump into like reflecting on what that means and what we can do and how we can help each other, especially when it comes to school communities and working with children and parents and how we can all work together, maybe you can give us a little insight into, I guess, what it is that drives the work that you are doing currently. Uh, maybe, maybe something that has inspired your journey through what, if there is something, maybe there's nothing crazy inspirational that has gone on. But I like to ask people to bring you right up to the present day. What along your journey has inspired what you're doing now? Well, I am a longtime pediatrician. I've been a pediatrician for about 23 years. And I'm also board certified in obesity medicine. And I have a really strong interest in kids who are struggling with extra weight and I and and helping their parents because as a pediatrician the patient is actually the child the the child comes to me but really who I'm talking to and also treating is the parents mm -hmm. you know I, I have a very personal attachment to that because I have struggled with my weight my whole life 
that since I was nine or 10 years old, I was a kid who gained weight easily and I didn't want to be overweight, but I couldn't figure out how to, how to change my situation. Um, and the advice that my parents got from their doc, from my doctor was for me to just stop eating as much. So just get her to stop eating as what well, you know, and you know, that's obviously not great advice to give a 10 year old <laughs> uh, yeah. person or any, any human being. But so over the years, I've, I've struggled so much with what I made my weight mean about me. Something's wrong. Something's not quite right. How come these other people are eating what I'm eating, but they're not gaining weight. And so, and, and then I'll fast forward, you know, decades, honestly, it wasn't until I was about 50 years old when I came into, when I just by chance encountered life coaching and it was through life coaching that I was able to actually lose weight, the, the, mm. lose the weight that I wanted to. And that's fine, you know, good, my health improved. But more important than that was I became free from that problem because I now knew I learned the tools and the skills that I could be in charge of, you know, what I was eating, all of the, all of the things that allowed me to weigh what I want to weigh. And so I guess for me, what I'm, what I decided to do with the, with the rest of my career is try to help either parents themselves that are struggling with their weight mm -hmm. um, or pa parents of kids who are struggling with extra weight, teach the parents the tools and skills that they need that so that they can help their kids not necessarily lose weight because it's not really about the weight, the number, but yeah. it's, just about their health and save them so much distress and discomfort and the honestly the pain and suffering of if you if you are overweight and you don't want to be it is it is really really a hard thing for for most people to manage so that's what i decided to do so then i and it and it really ties in with you know awareness and focus and being mm -hmm. present and being mindful and making choices on purpose. And, um, and it's so powerful because honestly, the same skills that you need to, or the same skills that you can use to help manage your weight or make food choices are super important life skills that will help you in every other aspect of your life as well. Yeah. So when you discovered the coaching aspect and the helpfulness of, of diving into that. Um, was it a discipline or a routine type of like, what was it that kind of started to click for you as being, as feeling like something was working that was different? Well, it was two things. Um, one was, it was a different, it was so funny that I learned a different medical approach to weight loss through life coaching than I did through medicine. So mm. this approach is, is becoming more and more like well known, but it's, it's basically eating in a way that, um, keeps your insulin level low. It doesn't go, it's, it's called the carbohydrate insulin model of weight gain and weight loss. I started decreasing the amount of process, seriously decreasing the amount of processed foods, decreasing the amount of added sugars, and decreasing the amount of flour in my daily diet. And, and what that did hormonally for me was kind of, we use the term like reset to factory settings, kind of like what we were talking about before, like going back to our ancient human bodies, they right. weren't designed eating these foods. Right. So I started eating in this new way and what happened was my body responded so well and I had so much more energy and I wasn't hungry because why I had failed so many previous diets was I was always hungry. Um, so eating in this new way, choosing new foods to eat allowed me to uh, really feel kind of like just natural in my eating. I eat when I'm hungry and I stop when I've had enough. And it's just allowed my body to kind of be how it should be. And the other thing that I was going to add about the life coaching part that was so mm -hmm. powerful was 
and it's going to sound so obvious when I say it, but it's, it's really so powerful when you think about it. It's based on the cognitive behavioral therapy model that our thoughts create our feelings and our mm-hmm. feelings drive our actions. So when mm-hmm. you are a person who eats like, like for me, emotional reasons or, you know, stress or boredom or, uh, fun even to add fun to your life or you know mm-hmm. all of these things that that action of eating is not just happening out of the blue it's coming so you can trace it back to a thought and a feeling that you're having um that's driving you to take that action and that in and of itself to that knowledge it's so empowering and freeing because then you can be like oh it's my thoughts that are creating you know my feelings which is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. So those two things put together for me were really honestly life-changing for me. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so awesome. I have to help people figure this out. Yeah. That, I mean, that's great that you're able to, you were able to make that connection to and, and start to work towards helping other people on that path. And I'm thinking about when you first started explaining this a few minutes ago and you mentioned the idea of and it kind of sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, but the idea of telling a parent or who's trying to help their child or telling the child themselves like, oh, just stop eating. It reminds me of how, I mean, we apply that that to almost anything. It's reactive, right? Mm-hmm. Someone has trouble um, controlling some sort of impulse or or overdoing anything. And, and and sometimes I have people in my life that even say that for just to be funny. They're like, well, just stop. Right. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, okay, I didn't think of that. <laughs> um, but it reminds me of how we often extend that sentiment to saying, well, just stop scrolling like on your phone, right? Um, well, just, well, just don't do that for an hour every day. And I'm like, all right, well, obviously I don't want to do that for an hour every day, but it's, but everyone around me is also doing it. Or, you know, I'm, when I do it, I become, I find out five other things that I want to look at or whatever you're doing that makes you keep doing it or doing something related to it every single day. If you use the coaching, if you really wanted to change that behavior, if that mm-hmm. was, if that scrolling was having a negative consequence in your life that you were like, actually, I do really want to change this. So the next time you, you, you're feeling the urge to pick up your phone and go to whatever app, you would yeah. hopefully, hopefully have a little bit of awareness, be able to pause, and then ask yourself, what feeling am I really looking for here? I want to numb out or I want to, or I'm bored or I'm, I don't want to do, I love that. I don't want to do this hard task I have coming up, you know? And so the real question is like, what are you hoping that scrolling will solve for you. Yeah. Thinking of avoidant behaviors, right? Why do we do anything, anything that brings us out of the now or out of the present? And sometimes it's because we don't want to do the thing that we are about to sit down and do, or that someone maybe is telling us to do. We feel like we're being forced to do it. It's why we relate so much of this stuff to childhood, because it's a time where we're often being asked to do so many things in our day that are not our choice. And so we relate, we learn a lot of those avoidant behaviors at certain points, especially going into middle school, right? We learn mm-hmm. like how to, how to not do something that we don't want to do and how to build our own little personal cushion, right? What makes me feel good when X, Y, Z is supposed to happen or what? I feel like that's when all of that stuff starts to develop our relationship to the environment around us, to our feelings, to the way we react to certain people or commands or activities. But I am thinking about the way we're talking about all of these kinds of behaviors. And I'm wondering, we mentioned awareness several times already. And to get to that point where you're saying either, oh my gosh, an hour just went by, I'm scrolling. And you're noticing that that thing is not making you feel good or that it's bad or that, you know, your friends just did something cool and you didn't, you weren't with them you know, whatever the case may be. And similar, if you then move that experience and apply it to eating or food or any, any, literally any of these behaviors, I'm wondering if in your practice and experience you have, um, are people coming to you already having reached a level of awareness or are you helping them move into that, that a certain 
point of awareness where they then can do these things on their own? Like how much help do they need there? It's a pretty big spectrum. And mm-hmm. so I think there needs to be some education even in the first, you know, there needs to be some understanding that there is a different way or, right. you know, so some people, co- some people come and they're like, I have a problem that I really want help solving. And, and some people, you know, are still on that runway of like, is this even a problem? I can't tell. And, but helping people gain awareness and in, in either step is so powerful. So it just depends on the individual person. It's very, very individual. And then is it difficult or are there specific steps that are taken for them to, I mean, because everyone needs, is always going to need some level of support from other people around them and any, mm-hmm. anything like this that they're doing. But there, is there, are there steps that are taken that can get a person to take, take a, more ownership on like themselves as an individual? Like where, I don't know. I feel like so much of our struggles today are feeling like we don't have control or like we're not supposed to have agency over. And I know that a lot of this comes from uh, feeling like other things like our technology around us is ta- is just in charge of our attention and where our attention should go. And what we see on those in media, what we see in media is often part of that control. And we then, I think, can kind of be a little tricked into thinking that, well, I just sit here and receive, you know, whatever, whatever is told to me, I do. I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to do that. I don't have any control over my attention. And control over what you eat is part of you're paying attention to, part of what where your attention goes. So I'm just thinking about agency and personal agency, like how much it might be that with food and eating habits, people need more ongoing support. But I don't know, like at one point you see like someone's able to take agency and you can see that's that's going to be really empowering for them. I think the things we're talking about, they're all this, it's all the same in the big picture of things. Using your screen, um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, we, in the coaching world, we call it buffering. And what you're, you know, you're using something external to try to, uh, fix an internal, not a problem, but it might be a feeling or, or something, but you know, Mm -hmm. over shopping, over drinking, over eating, over scrolling, anything like that. They're, they're all very, very similar problems. Right. And if you were able to just have full agency without any help or without any support, then you, you're going to fix, oh, I have a problem. Oh, I'll fix it. You know, I'll stop. I'll change my behavior. I'll start doing that. Most of us can't do that, right? That is that easily. And I think it helps us to understand the brain that we have, the understand why it's hard to put down your phone why it's hard to stop eating chips or Doritos or whatever you're, you know, um, and it helped, it really helped me. And I know it helps my clients to understand the way their brain is working. That is leading us to do that. Meaning, Mm -hmm. Oh, it feels good. You eat this food, it triggers a bunch of other, you know, chemical release, but we mentioned dopamine Dopamine mm-hmm. is a, you know, people think of it as a feel good hormone, but it's also a, a learning hormone. It's, it's a hormone that teaches us, um, motivation, motivation, exactly. Mm-hmm. And do the, so that it creates this loop. So, okay. So the next time you'll just eat that again or, you know, scroll again. So we have to understand how our brain is actually working and then we can decide to use a different part of our brain, like the prefrontal cortex part of our brain, the thinking on purpose brain to, oh, okay, here I am in 20, we're in 2023 right now, you know, but I have this brain that's thousands and thousands of years old, but I can use my prefrontal cortex to decide on purpose, you know, what I'm going to do. And I think that that's so empowering for people Mm -hmm. when they and to have some compassion, like, of course, you know, uh, this, yeah. food, this food is designed to keep us eating it. These drinks are designed to keep us drinking. The, the social media apps are designed to keep us scrolling. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fine. There's, they're not going to change because of all the money involved. And that's just a whole nother topic. But I'm so, <laughs> I'm so horrified that, you know, we have this massive health problem related to 
the food that we're eating and the lifestyles that we're living. Um, and yet we keep supporting the companies that are pushing these foods out to right. people are actively making people sick. It's not that they're neutral and not harming, you know, it's not that they're neutral. They are harming people. It's that it's part of their purpose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, part yeah. of their purpose is to make money. And so like we're talking about, you know, awareness and fostering agency. I talk about that all the time with my clients, for my parents to help their kids, because ultimately all of the things that we're talking about, we want our kids as they age to be able to step into the ownership of their decisions. Mm -hmm. So understanding the decisions that they make and why they're making them and then how that affects them. And so I'm guessing that a lot of this process of, of when you're talking about learning how to use the different part of the brain and motivation, a lot of process of getting individuals to take that ownership awareness and then ownership independent of needing so much help from others likely has a lot to do with goal setting is what I'm thinking, right? And that's got to be a very individualized process for each person. Yeah. And I, I think it's temperament based too. And I think, okay. I think it's just, and also it's, there, there's so many factors influencing this mm -hmm. and it, it's, how do you feel about yourself? Do you think you're a person who can actually, are you, you know, quote strong enough or can you make these changes or are you a person who can succeed at that? It's, it's your self belief. I happen yeah. to believe everybody can, can change. I mm -hmm. change. And if I can change, anybody can change. <laughs> so I truly believe that. But it's, you know, you, we bump into this all the time. People have these self-limiting beliefs, limiting mm -hmm. stories. The stories they're telling themselves are, are not helpful. And so that's like, I love that the power of coaching when you're, if someone's willing to, to talk about that or willing to look at that. You, you know, what I always say is you can keep your story. That's fine. You know, you're, it's yours and it, I'm not trying to take it away from you, but let's look at how what you're saying to yourself. Is that helping you get what you really want or be mm -hmm. the person you really want to be? And so I just think that that is so empowering. And I want all parents to know this because I want parents to teach their kids that and have have the kids have the freedom to really, you know, not be limited by the stories they're telling themselves. And what you just said about who you want to be, to me, that's, that's actually the kind of goal setting that I'm thinking about when it comes to lifestyle habits that you're trying to change. Because I mean, that's how I think of things. Like I'm constantly having to say, as someone who's changed her life path like four times since in the last 20 years, yeah. like, um, and, and all of it is getting is as I learn more about who it is that I want to be or what kind of lifestyle I want to embody. Like you just learn what contributes to that life along the way and you have to tweak it. And so, you know, some of the things we're talking about are, are ways that that starts early on you know, in childhood, when you're, th when you, when you don't have a lot of agency over a lot of, a yeah. lot of other things, what is yours to kind of start to think about, but the way you, what you put into your body and your mind, I think is where we start. And then as you get older, what do you want? Like, who do you want to be? What is the person and what do you need to do to bring to, to kind of draw that life to you um, and create it around you? And I think that is so powerful. I have a son who's 11 right now. He's about to be 12 in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And we have this discussion all the time. Who do you want to be? Like he plays sports. Who do you want to be on the soccer field? Who do you want to be in your class, in your classroom? And, you know, so this is such a, this period of time for him is such a, a period of growth of, um, you know, trying to discover who he really is and, or not discover who he really is, but step into who he really is and right and be and let that grow and evolve let yeah grow and follow your interests and follow and i will say looking back at my life this is something that me being an overweight teenager i was so distracted by my weight and trying to fit in i didn't really focus on that on what we're talking about like like developing into your authentic self and right. and, and at least my own personal journey was so affected by my weight 
that mm-hmm. I, you know, it sucked up so much of my brain energy. And I, so I feel very strongly like we got to help our kids. I don't even care what you weigh, but don't let your weight suck up all your mental energy so that you can't do these other super important development. I like that you're saying like the number isn't a problem, but if it's something that for you specifically is, is on your mind, energy is a big thing to me. What takes up your, en- your physical and mental energy, the mental being the big thing, because it affects everything else. If you, it's just like any other kind of cyclical thought. And it's even more powerful when you're young and you don't have a lot of other life experiences to compare it to or other people outside of your immediate you know, home base and home community to, com- you just don't know how other people think and that there are other paths and ways to do something. So coaching through, I, I see that path as something that's very like useful way to start learning and implementing strategies that really, like you said earlier, are not just for the problem that you're facing at that moment in your life. They're, they're meant to be, that's why it's called that's why it's called coaching, right? I mean, if you talk to high school athletes that had great coaches, they still they still quote those coaches 20 yeah. years later like and and they're, you know, you're a coach for a reason. I mean, that that name is there for a reason and it's it's meant to be applied over time. So, I'm wondering if there is there's anything I I know that our audience primarily right now at this moment is a lot of educators, parents as well, of course, but a lot of educators and school leaders, people who work in support of school communities. And so, I wanted to know if maybe there's any I hate to say advice, but something that maybe you want to leave the a population of people who work so closely with young people every day and likely is hearing a lot of what you're saying and having it resonate with with things that they see in and out of their classroom. So I'm wondering if there's anything that you would leave people in this profession with as far as working with people that might be dealing with any kind of any kind of issue that is compulsory or taking over the loop the looping thinking of the mind, you know, any of these things that you could, you, we know teachers are the first people that see those issues. I guess I would say, um, how the model you're setting at school or mm-hmm. in the environment where, that you're interacting with the kids, because the kids are still watching, are watching. And so the parents, I mean, the, um, well, definitely the parents for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, being like, healthy role model. I know that sounds so boring and generic and blah. I mean, we, that's all I talk about these days is modeling in terms of everything. Um, It's so powerful. mm -hmm. It's so powerful. Um, And so it's, and it's the same thing with our phones, with our, with our movement, Mm -hmm. our ex, our, as an adult, our exercise. Basically I, I, you know, I'm working on who do I want to be the parent I want to be on purpose for mm-hmm. my child. Who do I want him to see? What do I want him to see me doing every day and not doing, you know? And the other thing that I that I love the whole idea of and that I think so many kids benefit from if we do it on purpose is being willing to reflect back to the child. Be the mirror that reflects mm. back to the child their their a hundred percent worthiness and their they're a hundred percent valuableness without them having to do anything. Like you don't have to have good behavior. You know, yeah, we want good behavior, of course. <laughs> I'm not you're saying like, that. You like scratch that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I teachers are like yeah. off. Um but- <laughs> <laughs> they just turned us off. We're not yeah. listening anymore. <laughs> she is a quack. Um, uh, my point is like, for example, for, I'll just say overweight as an example. We oftentimes kids who are overweight or teens who are overweight. They feel less valuable and less mm-hmm. seen and less worthy than their normal weight peers. And they think I need to lose weight so that I can be a better person or a more valuable person. Right. Whatever they have applied to that. Yeah, Yeah. Mm-hmm. exactly. So I think, you know, we might tell them that's not true and using our words, but even a little bit more powerful for that is if in your interactions with the child, you are just reflecting back to them their goodness, their wholeness. They're already 
done perfection. They don't need to change. You know, yes, right. there's reasons to want to change. You can evolve. But they have to be, that motivation has to be like, I don't feel good because of this. But it it can't be, I think so-and-so is perfect. Like you're saying, right? Placing those comparison models is not the reason to change anything. The reason to change is something that you feel like you want to be better at something. Yeah, knowing that you're already good, good mm -hmm. inside, good enough, good. And then, okay, and I want to change the way I'm eating or the way I'm sleeping or the way I'm whatever, moving. And anything. we know how hard that is for adults to yeah. do. It's so hard for everybody. And the kids are always looking to our to us grown-ups to tell us how they should feel about themselves. So we right. need to be telling them you got to feel we or or you can feel good about yourself because you're good, you know. Right. And then they'll internalize that and then they'll then they'll be more empowered and they'll feel more free and they'll it'll be easier for them to change. So much easier to change from a place of wanting to change as opposed to like I have to change so that I can, you know, be better. And it's the same thing and I think about when I'm thinking back to using, you know, technology or or how much time I spend on a certain app or social media like I know why something doesn't make me feel good and I also know the things that I could replace that time with or I should replace that time with. And this is not just talking about me but anybody, but I think it might be a healthy way to simil like similarly to be thinking about the issues that you're talking about, because it can't just be comparing yourself to other people. Like part of, I think that modeling is saying, well, if I were, I want to change this about myself. And if I do, here are the benefits, right? Yeah. Outside, like here's the other parts of my life. Like we were saying earlier about it's not just applicable to one activity, but like how are other parts of my life going to change if I change this thing? And that's how I like to think about anything like, as far as getting internal motivation, that's going to be, you're immediately cultivating it, but you are going to see the results play out over time and they only get stronger and it'll get easier, right? Is if you realize that the one thing you want to focus on or put, pull your attention towards is going to have effects on other things. Some of them could be your relationships. It could be the way you feel like your confidence in some way is going to change drastically. And that could show itself in in many ways. It could show itself in your academic life, in your friendships, in your fam, in the way you talk or relate to your family, your willingness to be around other people more. Like, there's just so many ways. And then once that happens, right? I'm okay with you know with now going out with my friends. I feel more confident. Then maybe you you realize you are actually a social person and not an introvert. Like so many little shifts that can happen and are waiting to happen can't happen until those first things, um, which are the hardest things start. What you're talking about, Sarah, is this like very advanced thinking process, a meta skill of thinking, you know, setting goals, thinking about your thinking, changing your thinking so that you can get to the goals that you want. And that's amazing, but that's like a grown up skill. <laughs> I know. It's so hard. <laughs> that part of your brain is your prefrontal cortex. Yeah. And that's like the CEO of your life, right? He's mm -hmm. a five year plan for you. And our kids and teens, their prefrontal cortexes are still developing. So this is why they need the parents and their role models and their teachers and their guardians to kind of help them in so many different ways because their brain is just their brain is just not mature enough by definition. And that's right. fine. Mm -hmm. They need their parents' help to eventually get to this place. Like what you just- For self-motivation, yeah. Yeah, what you were just talking about. Right. I'm already talking to my 11-year-old about that, you know? Right. Well, you could choose to not do your homework, but let's think about like what the downstream effects of that are. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's talk about, okay, you do, if you do do your homework, what are the downstream effects of that? He can't, or at least for him in particular, he can't do that. On Make those own. specific decisions. Yeah. But he will be able to as he ages. And so he's right. already getting good practice. And I can already see he's making better choices for himself. And then at some point, like you're saying, and depending on the activity and the age, but like at some point... He'll do something and realize, oh, it's because my mother does this all the time. Or <laughs> I didn't realize that like I did like 
like you don't realize when someone has been modeling something for you when you just start doing it yeah. and then the positive effect or whatever it might be happens and you're like, oh, that's what's supposed to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I did want to ask you before we go, if there's anything maybe you want to recommend to our listeners that either you're reading or listening to recently that might be doesn't have to be inspiring or have to have anything to do with the work you're doing, but just gives us a nice full picture of who you are and what's going into your brain. Sure. I I am reading this while I'm listening to it on Audible or on my daily walks or driving. Um, mm-hmm. I'm listening to this book called um, Your Brain on Art. Oh, um, cool. It's so, it's, it's so fascinating. Um, these two women, I wrote down their names, Susan, I might m- mispronounce it, Susan Magsman and Ivy Ross. I heard them on the radio discussing this topic. And so they, they were so fascinating. But it's how art, either being the creator and making art or viewing art, um, changes our brain and how we can on purpose, if we start to mm-hmm. really care, like, oh, this is possible for me. It's like a therapeutic, you can use it therapeutically for yourself to improve your mood, improve, mm. improve your health, improve your health outcomes. It's so fascinating. I haven't completely finished the book, so I, um, but it's so far, so it's so fascinating. That's part of, it's reminding me, I don't know if you've ever read The Artist's Way. Uh, oh, yeah. which is such a, <laughs> it's such a, uh, now become like this iconic thing for people who are creators to kind of get, um, build a reflective creative life. But part of the method in that book is they recommend that you do, and they call it an art walk once a week. And I guess that really depends on where you live, how often you can do that. But it's literally just taking yourself on a walk or a date by yourself. It could be one hour finding something that you can walk through, or even if it's a street that just has a lot of things to look at, that you can slow down and look at um, a a park that has murals in it, like something that is you're looking at um, things that have been created by other human beings and and observing them on your own and maybe mentally reflecting and, and taking that, thinking of how often we don't do that kind of thing on purpose. Right. But making it like, oh, it's time for my art walk. <laughs> and, and then you do it. Maybe it's one hour every Friday afternoon. You go on an art walk somewhere and you drive yourself somewhere and you walk around. It could be a museum, like a traditional place where it's filled with art. But it could also just be walking around a new neighborhood and looking yeah. for looking for art that you've never looked at before. Yeah. That's so cool. I know. I, you know, I, I love that idea. Maine. And so we have, a, I live right, you know, tons of gorgeous nature, gorgeous scenery. So I kind of do that. I just, I I do that, but with nature, but mm-hmm. I haven't ever tried on purpose. Oh, I should look around and look at. I just started doing it like a month me, ago me. and it's so great. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. That's cool. I like the sound of that book though. That's yeah. I'm going to look, look into mm-hmm. that. And what about listening? Are you listening to anything or you can say no and just we can go on our way. <laughs> you mean? No, any, I mean, podcast, I don't know, I'm a podcast listener. Oh, but, um, geez, I'm a huge podcast listener too. Well, I listen to the Life Coach School podcast, which I think everybody should. It is so <laughs> empowering and freeing. I think Brooke Castillo, the, she's a genius. Um, mm-hmm. I also listen to a podcast called, I think it's called On Being Well with a, mm-hmm. a a person you might know, uh, Rick Hansen. He's a PhD. Okay. Uh, yeah, and he's, it's his podcast, his son. It's actually his son's podcast. And then he's on it a lot. Okay. Uh, they talk about these really, um, really just interesting psych t- topics in psychology. And, um, but so I'm a, I'm a podcast consumer. I, I, oh, me too. <laughs> mostly to get my cleaning done. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm always, I know the, what's released every day of the week. It's, it's, yeah, it's me a problem. Too. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, sometimes I'm like, oh, it's Tuesday. It's time for such, such and such. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my life. And so then lastly, let's just give everybody some insight into where they can find you on the internet or um, I'm not sure if you have social media you'd like to share with anybody where they can connect with you, but anywhere where you'd like to give people some more access to you and your work. I have a website, um, mm-hmm. SheilaCarrollMD.com. 
Mm -hmm. And then I am on social media, but just kind of a little bit. I I am trying to up my social media game. Okay. No problem. (laughs) Just my Instagram (laughs) at Sheila Carroll MD, I think is is what on Instagram. I am trying to really offer, I have a blog on my website and people could email me. Um, Mm -hmm. I am trying to provide uh, education and skills and tools that parents can use to help their kids. So that's, that's my focus. Great. And so all of that, we'll have all of those links and information in the show notes. So people don't have to run and write something down. They can go and click on links pretty easily here. Well, thank you so much for talking with me for being what I'm pretty sure by when this comes out will be the first person interviewed on the Optimalist podcast that is from outside of our immediate educational circle, which is so cool. Wow, thank you. I feel honored. (laughs) I hope this episode inspired you to reflect a bit more deeply on the habits that we sort of collect for ourselves without even realizing it sometimes. How can we create new neural pathways to form better alignment with our goals and ability to flourish? You can let us know what you think by leaving a comment on Substack if you are a subscriber, a review in Apple Podcasts, and you can reach me on Twitter at scandela9. The hashtag optimalist can be used when posting answers to questions we ask here, and I'll be sure to see it. I can also be reached at Sarah that with no H at getengageable.com. You can listen and subscribe to the Optimalist podcast wherever you love listening to great podcasts. New episodes are released every Wednesday and links to all the resources mentioned in this episode are available in the show notes. The Optimalist podcast is brought to you by Engageable, the only app that gives you the mindful pulse you need for doing better. And it's free. Create an account today at getengageable.com or by downloading Engageable on any iOS or Android device. You can also follow us at Get Engageable on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Optimalist, and I'll be back next week with a new conversation. Stay engaged.